Is that it? We're on? No opening video? <laughs> And that was video. Very good. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining. That was beautiful. We, uh, we, are, we are all gathered here for another fantastic um, live stream event from the Oil & Gas Global Network. This is actually a brand new one. This is, a, uh, this is uh, the very first installment in a new series uh, that, we're, that we're just launching right now. In fact, if you, if you had tuned into our... Um, our here and now event a couple of weeks ago where we were celebrating among other things we were celebrating a million downloads of the oil and gas this week podcast which is that's the big one that's the one that started it all uh with mark lacour a couple of years ago and we were also celebrating the launch of a bunch of new programs uh this is one of them and so there's there's a bunch of new podcasts there's a bunch of there's new live streams and it's all very exciting and it's moving very quickly so uh be sure to tune in and look for those uh, I also want to, before we get into this, I, I want to give a big thanks to uh, to our sponsor, our friends at NVIDIA, who are sponsoring this series. It shouldn't be too surprising that um, NVIDIA wants to give back to the oil and gas community by sponsoring a series on artificial intelligence and machine learning in oil and gas. So that's what we're going to be talking about. That's what the series is about. It's a really big topic, so uh, we're not going to cover it all today. And... And, and we're gonna we're gonna save some material for subsequent episodes. But what we want to do today is just kind of look, um, you know, just take a broad look at where these technologies fit into the industry. Um, you know, what's getting the most attention, and really, maybe most importantly, how we can develop a nice cohesive approach that everyone can believe in. Because not only is it a big topic, but it's also a little bit controversial, and we may we may get into a little bit of that today. So before we get though into the discussion, let me introduce our panelists. And I, I have to say this is the most uh, panelists that I've tried to do this with so far. So I don't know like whose idea it was to let all you guys onto onto the program, but if this turns into a circus, it's not my fault. So um, let's start with, uh, I'm gonna go clockwise around the Brady Bunch squares here. We were joking earlier that we're, we wanna work on like learning to talk to each other to the through the so I'm gonna look at Mark and say Mark spiel <laughs> it's, it's fantastic Mark is Mark is representing uh, our spot so the, our sponsor was also kind enough to dedicate a panelist so Mark why don't you start I know that you are the global energy director for Nvidia which means you're out there talking to a bunch of people um, you also had a lot of years at Halliburton and I think I remember something that goes all the way back to the days of Silicon Graphics. So you are not any uh, stranger to this. What else, what else can you tell us about yourself real quick before we get started? Sure, thanks a lot for having me today. Um, <clears throat> NVIDIA is, uh, is an accelerated computing company. And although we've been active in the oil and gas industry for better part of 15 years, um, AI is, is where our business is heading. And uh, for the energy sector, it's, uh, it's an opportunity for us to educate the sector. And so uh, I've been with NVIDIA for about two years. And as you mentioned, Halliburton for 13 years before that in a variety of roles and SGI before that. So I've been in oil and gas for the better part of my career and um, happy to be back in the tech space right now and, and figuring out how we help uh, oil and gas companies transition to energy companies and leverage the assets that they've been building over the years with uh, AI. Right, right, great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, and thanks again for, for uh, Mark was a big part of the the kind of conceptualizing, putting the series together, and and uh, just coming up with the ideas and getting it going. So, so thanks to you for that. Uh, going around the circle, we got Kevin O'Donovan, who has you probably have the same grief in your life that I have with O'Sullivan, which is that the age of computers has stripped out that apostrophe at the beginning. So we always have this weird consonant thing at the beginning. So anytime you're trying to check into a hotel or like talk to somebody about your credit card on the phone, right? It's always, it's always a disaster. But besides that, I know that you're a technology evangelist and your LinkedIn profile says something about a little bit of this and that. So tell us, tell us what this and that is all about. Uh, good evening from the south of France, folks. Um, so I spend my time looking at new technologies and innovation right across the energy sector. Uh, my background is in IT sales. I was with Compaq, HP, uh, Intel. Uh, I set up Intel sales and marketing into the energy sector for ran that for about 10 years. 
Uh, three years ago, I set up my own company, and the name of the company is A Bit of This and That. <laughs> so, um, so that's where that that's comes why it says that. That's why it says that on your LinkedIn profile. And kind of long story short, I spend my time working with companies, um, helping them understand some of the technology landscapes and working with them on their go-to-market plans and helping them get their story out there. So there's, um, it's, a, it's a bit of this and that. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. And the oh yeah, so it's a little bit. It's getting a little bit late for you. Appreciate you staying up uh, to watch the to watch late night TV with us. Um, next we have Kayla Ball. Kayla, uh, I've known Kayla for a long time, so I know a few things about her. But I know that right now that you are the the senior vice president of product at this new rocket ship company called Veladere. Veladere. Um, you're also an exploration geologist. You've been a software product manager, and once upon a time, you were known as that little girl with the pink boots tromping around the well site, if I'm not mistaken. So what else? What did I miss? Yeah, for sure. Um, oil patch kid through and through, grew up uh, out in the fields, made my way to the office. Um, I'm a geologist by background, but have kind of converted myself into a technology <laughs> uh, philanthropist of sorts. and. Yeah, just over uh, a decade of product management, uh, energy-based SaaS uh, type of upbringing. Excellent, good, thank you. And um, Ration, Ration Tulsi, right. also, also <clears throat> another. So, so, so Ration and I have some interesting history together where we've uh, tried to do a number of different things and failed. So <clears throat> I'm not. <laughs> Hopefully this 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 episode will be our first big success. But no, Ration is um, uh, you are uh, you're now at, at Databricks, I know, and you spent a lot of years at Schlumberger. And um, but my favorite things about you are these things like I know you're a a, a, a photographer and you're a, a, a drone pilot. And my my number one favorite thing is that you're an actual samurai, right? Like not are you not. Not like, wow, that guy's really great. He's a samurai, but you're an actual samurai. So, um, so chime in. What else? Uh, what else do you want us to to know? Yeah. So that's pretty much my entire introduction. Thanks, Mike. There's I have nothing <laughs> else to add to that statement. There, you can just move on from that. No, I mean, you know, it's it's, it's still true. Exactly. I even have a little Japanese certificate to prove it from an instruction in Kyoto. I've seen the photo. I've seen the yeah, photo. Yeah, which, you know, the costume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, you know, I, I worked in, at Schlumberger for several years, and, and then, um, you know, I've been, I've been talking about data. So I've been doing lots of talks at, like, these schools about data, 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 and then eventually I decided that it's time for me to dog food my own thinking, and I decided to take a career in data science, and I joined Databricks, and it's been a very interesting experience. Fantastic. I, I forgot to mention that you also... You're an AI enthusiast, and you do go around and speak to people a lot about that, and 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 are involved in that community quite a bit, right? Um, which is why we which is why we lured you into this uh, to this panel. And uh, last but not least, Dr. Daniel Zweidler, uh, who's lurking in the shadows uh, in in front of his window. Um, Dan, Dan, Daniel, it's great to I got to say it's great to see you here. It's been a long time since we've caught up, so we'll have to catch up for real after we do this. But um, you've been in the industry uh, for so long, doing so many things at so many different levels. I don't even really even know how to sum it up. So just go ahead and, and, and give your version. Yeah, just a bit more information. 20 years with Royal Dutch Shell, four years with Merck Pharmaceuticals. The reason is I was tired to be a rock star, so I decided to become a drug dealer. <laughs> After a few years, so 10, 10, years, <laughs> 10 years ago, I decided to open my own company. So it's a geological service company and consulting firm. And I'm also currently CEO of an oil company in the UK, North Sea. And that's it. That's all you that do. That sums it up. That's, that's, yeah. There's nothing else, right? Well, I filled, filled up at least seven passports, yes. Excellent. Well, we're, we're, we're grateful that you actually have time to, to, to participate in, in stuff like this. So that's it. That's our panel. Um, we have we got a we have a really nice kind of agenda laid out here. We'll see where it goes. I want to I want to start. We're talking about AI in oil and gas in energy even more broadly. I mean, those terms are beginning to become interchangeable. Um, but let's start with uh, before we get into the nuts and bolts. Let's start with just the philosophy. Um, and we know that uh, AI and all these related capabilities, um, apart from the technical implications, it kind of represents like a shift in the way we think about what we do, how we're going to do it, how we're going to execute these different aspects of the business. Um, we know it's disruptive and it's it stirs up a few very strong 
opinions. So let's talk about like, what does it really mean to the industry? And, you know, and maybe what does it not mean? So Mark, um, since you're the sponsor and because your LinkedIn headline says that you are a transformational leader. So I'm going to put you on the spot first uh, because we talk a lot about transformation. Um, you know, nowadays it's, it's in every conversation and, um, but besides, you know, all the tools and the methods and the process, when we think about AI and we think about transformation, you know, what, how, how should we be adapting our way of thinking like in a positive way to bring this into the business? And I know you're out there talking to people in different places and different things. So what's like, before we even get, you know, put hands on stuff, how do we need to adapt our thinking? Oh, that, <clears throat> that's a great question. What I would say is that uh, for, you know, you talk about the transformational leader and, and, you know, earlier this year we had a executive briefing and the company that came in brought in a change management leader as part of their visit to Silicon Valley. And I thought that was just fantastic because typically people come in and they want to know about our technology, where we're going. But the fact that this oil and gas company brought in a change management leader as part of their team going out and evaluating new technology told me that they got it. It's not about the technology itself. It's about what you're trying to achieve with that technology. And to do that, you've got to have a mindset change, right? Digital transformation is not simply a move from on-prem to the cloud or, you know, automating things, but it's changing how people are going to work, how they're going to be able to access data and use data in the future. And I think if people can start to wrap their heads around the fact that they've been collecting data for so many years and not throwing it away because they figured at some point they're going to use it. And now is the time where computing has actually caught up, you know, to a point where you can actually leverage this data. People still can't wrap their heads around that. And they just assume that it's uh, outsourcing of their job or doing things different. Right. Right. But really, it's how do, how do individuals get to do their jobs better? They don't have to search for data anymore. The data just comes to them. They're able to access this data and make better decisions using this data, not necessarily a machine making the decisions for them. Yeah, yeah. If we grasp that, it'll be better. Right. Yeah, the, co the culture thing is... Uh... And the, and the change management, we definitely want to get to that uh, in a bit here. But that's um, it's a good point, which is that, uh, you know, it's it's a it's a tool that can help people do their job better. Um, and and it also we have and we have capabilities now that we just didn't have before. So we're going to get to that in a bit, too. But I think all of that goes into maybe understanding. Um, and I think what the title of this was uh, demystifying. So we want to we want to try to do that, too. Um, but it, so, so, so good. Thank you. In terms of thinking about this philo philosophical kind of approach, I also know that, um, you know, we have this age old problem of sometimes um, we're doing something without really knowing why we're doing it. And Kayla, I know that you always like to say, well, first, let's make sure that we know what problem we're solving. And, and these new technologies, of course, sometimes that's a good, you know, it's good to figure that out. And I know that that's a lot of what you did when you were rolling out new tech products to different business objectives and things like that. So what do you, what do you think about like, how do we do it right when it comes to uh, incorporating this kind of stuff into the business and make sure that we know what problem we're solving? For sure. Yeah. I mean, if I had a dollar for every team I've worked with that created problems just for the benefit of solving them, um, I probably would not be working today. Um, Sounds like a bunch of computer science people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, the, the interesting aspect for me is um, I have a lot of empathy for people who have to deliver results at the end of the day, right? And so I think for things to be successful, you have to align on what the particular problem is, make sure it's of value to, to the company, um, stack hands on the uh, expectation of, of what great looks like at, at the end of a project, and uh, set milestone check-in points along the way because I, I often work with teams where, you know, we've been trying to solve something for two years. It's like, okay, maybe we should work on another problem <laughs> because two years is a very long time uh, to still be spinning your wheels. Um, you know, the other thing I would also say about it is um, a lot of times we want the answer that we expect 
out of, out of how we leverage AI and ML. And I think if you can approach things from trying to understand the truth, um, whether it's good or bad in terms of result yeah. or yeah. outcome, um, that's an important concept to keep in mind as well as, as you work through it. Right. Yeah. We don't want to, um, we don't want to engineer it to give us the answers that we wanted in the first place. Right. right. You can find a correlation out of most things if you just make the model suffer enough. Or sure. More. Sure. <laughs> sure. Um, right. A um, increased ice cream sales cause more shark attacks. Right. That's the old, uh, the old problem. So, all right, good. And, and I mean, what you're, but what you're describing there is basically like just smart execution, the way we would do anything else in our business. We have to not lose sight of that when we get to these really like cool new capabilities that we're very, very excited about. Right. Right. Well, and a lot of times, you know, the results that come back are things that can't be operationally achieved anyway. Right. And so mm -hmm. that's why it's important to align on what does great look like? Are we as an organization willing to make these changes, whatever yep. the results may be? Um, right. And then, you know, you, you're working on the right. 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 Exactly. Excellent. Thank you. Um, which makes me think about something, um, something that I heard. Uh, so, so this kind of gets into another aspect of the philosophy, because sometimes when we're trying to make sure we know a problem we're solving, it's important if we know what is like what is real and what's not real. And, and Kevin, I've heard you say this before that, um, you know, making sure that we understand that we sift out what's what what's real versus, you know, these these new things come with a lot of hype. There's a hype cycle. And. Um, and one of the things that's just difficult for people to do, like Kayla says, and have a, a, a well a, a well done execution is we're not really sure how much of this is hype, how much is of, it, of it is real. You're out there evangelizing new technologies. So I, this is very much a part of your world. What kind of guidance do you give people when it comes to uh, to AI and, and all the related stuff? There, there's a fine balance we have to try and meet because to, to Mark's point is that we're talking about transformation and when any new technology, be it AI or pick anyone comes along, we're always looking for, you need to paint a picture as to how it will transform and the, 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 the art of the possible. And sometimes we get a bit carried away with that and somebody listening to us is going, you're talking about designing Skynet or that's my job <laughs> and what am I going to do when this thing all works? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so a lot of a lot of the time is kind of to Kayla's point is we, we need to kind of bring it back down and and I, you know in the entire series AI means many things to many people. Yep. And if you're talking to the C level execs, AI is kind of a buzzword. If you're talking to the guy who's been doing seismic reservoir modeling on high performance computing for the last fifty years, it means something totally different, right? right it's a different right. level of discussion. So I think we need to tailor the message. You have to paint a positive picture, but with a dose of realism. And if we can make it real, and what I mean by that is a simple example. Look, we have so many people out there today capturing data through drones and body cams and, 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 and. Well, no one's going to have a job to sit down and look at all those pictures, or at least I hope they won't, right? There's billions yeah. of them. So right, right. you use a piece of software to kind of compare. That's what it looked like last week. That's what it looks like this week. Is that corrosion or is that a water stain? Right, that, right. That's, that's AI software will do that. Yeah, so yeah, we have yeah. to make it tangible. Um, and because otherwise people just go, this is science fiction or it's same old, same old. Why would I bother? Um, so you have to create a, a bit of realism. So we should see, right. So um, I mean, right. I mean, it should be very practical, right? And um, and and once people can see some of that practicality, then they can start to understand. Okay, well, this is this is this is something real, and I don't know what these guys are talking about over there, but I can see how we can put it, it to work it's here. A journey, and yeah. it'll be different for every company, right? But it's a journey, sure. and and we just got to make it tangible. That's right. So. So on that journey, um, so we're getting a little bit into uh, making it real oftentimes uh, goes hand in hand with skepticism. And um, and I mentioned in the in the whole intro to this that uh, that this is, is still kind of a controversial topic. And Daniel, I'm, I'm thinking about you and because you're out because I know that you are very close to all of that, you know, the, the industry is built on this heritage of very smart, experienced people who know how to do particular things in particular ways. And, um, and I know you're very, you're very close to all that. So is it, is it, 
is it possible that we can bring together that kind of heritage of those seasoned veterans together, you know, with these new things in a way that like where where we can really like move forward and not just be constantly fighting like this battle of the old versus the new. And I know that gets into the culture topic, which we're going to get into a little bit later, but just, just kind of upfront as a general philosophy, how do you see that, that coming together or do you not see uh, that, that coming together? I, I think we have to change the language we're using. I think the most disruptive part of AI is the word AI in itself. Fair I mean, enough. Try to talk about artificial. I mean, because AI, if you just use artificial intelligence, everybody has some emotions around it. Yeah. Yeah. Whether it is this is just this is going to take my job. Yeah. To, to Kevin's point, it's going to take my job. Or what is this kind of stuff doing, anyways? Yeah. Also, you yeah. said the industry is a great heritage. That's true. What we shouldn't forget is this industry has created an incredible amount of value. Yeah. For mankind. So we're actually, you know, we're actually good at what we're doing. Yeah, we, we find large fields. We know how to do that. I mean, the team I'm currently leading, everybody has at least 30 years experience in the oil patch. And together, we've certainly discovered a few billion barrels of oil and gas. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, we kind of know what we're doing. So I think it's all about changing the language. Right. Well, it's an interesting point. And also, uh, yeah, go ahead. You also have, because we use AI, but in fact, if we use words, well, these are neural networks. That's fine. Everybody kind of understands what it is, even if it might not be correct. But it's not threatening, yeah? It's yeah. not going to replace my human brain because for an executive, if you tell him, well, I'm going to have a system which will make decisions for you, he's going to go, yeah, right, you know? I mean, <laughs> right. come on, go away, yeah, go away. Right. And also is to have the ability to answer very fundamental questions. You know, if somebody comes and presents a technology and then an executive says, okay, what is it going to do for my bottom line? And the person even doesn't understand my question, then there is a problem, yeah? Yeah, for sure. So it right. is all about what's it going to do for my bottom line, yeah? Low margins, right. what's, my, what's going to impact me? So we have to be really looking for that. Also, Thanks. when we talk about oil and gas, there's another important part, is oil and gas, while well, there's upstream, midstream, and downstream, they're fundamentally different. And if we just look at upstream, there's exploration, development, and production. And I think AI can be used in these different places completely differently, yeah? Yeah. 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 That's a, actually, <laughs> that's perfect. Cause you just set up several of the topics that we want to get to as we get into this, but, um, uh, cause I do want to, I do want to get into how do we al align to the industry? Um, you know, it's, uh, people always call it the oil and gas industry or now we, you know, maybe we say the energy industry, but the reality is it's like a whole bunch of different industries that are all bolted together to try to produce, you know, try to put you know, gas in our cars and make our outerwear and things like that. So, um, so I want to get into how does it align and where does it, where does it show up? Um, but before we do that, uh, I, Ration has been waiting patiently down here in the, in the bottom corner. And I know that, um, I, so I know that you're out there talking, um, to you know you're in the ai community in general and so you're seeing a lot of exposure to not just what's happening in this industry um but to some cool stuff and and you talk to people is um and, and we are in this industry we're beginning to learn the value of or appreciate the value of learning from people on the outside so what do you uh just just like kind of top of mind what do you think that we can learn from other places that maybe will help us adjust our thinking or our perspective about what we want to do with this stuff yeah thanks Doug. so you know i think to kick this off is i'm perfectly comfortable with ai replacing you know human beings in some of their thinking i've met many humans and you know we don't often make the best decisions right and <laughs> you know, when Henry Ford created the first industrial, company excluded, of course. <laughs> well, you know, Henry Ford created the first industrial automation, right? And yes, it put the horse and cart buggy business out of business, but it actually gave a boom to the automotive industry. Right? So, you know, some of these things are natural progression of both technology and, and progression, and we will see new jobs and careers coming out of it, right? And there will be a semblance between, you know, still managing uh, the subject matter experts that have, you know, the, the connections to human beings and clients and careers basically benefiting as AI as a tool. AI is just going to be fundamentally a tool until, you know, the singularity takes off and, you know, that'll be an interesting, interesting time, right? But to pivot very quickly to what Mark and Kevin said. So Mark said when he introduced us that, you know, suddenly data is everywhere. We have lots of data. And, you know, Kevin was talking about the challenges around data. And it's true. So for a successful AI model, data is the key. Mm. Right? And the oil and gas industry, 
it doesn't lack data. We have lots of it. It's just badly managed. It's just stored in silos. And that's something we have to address is how yeah. do we actually get access to it? And what we are seeing is, uh, and we see it in other industries, is we're seeing this rise of this connected ecosystem, ecosystems upon ecosystems. And I think you know a successful AI model would would benefit from a connected energy ecosystem. And uh, you, you know um, an example is um, we were an example would be is to take a simple use case like ESG, right? Which is uh, you know fundamentally it's more of a corporate initiative, and we're seeing lots of you know, we've seen carbon negative uh, initiatives being done uh, and people are being you know, rewarded on it. Uh, and it's a, it's a good metric to have. But the people in the field don't really, they're not really being rewarded on it. However, if you can just, you not just rename it, but if you can build data pipelines and use cases and use AI to drive it, you can actually build an entire um, like vertical and horizontal that reflects uh, an entire ESG use case that goes from the CEO level all the way down to operations. Like if you take supply chain reduction in uh, offshore drilling, Right. If you bring in predictive maintenance, uh, you can then reduce the inventory. You can then reduce transportation costs. You, you naturally reduce your carbon footprint. The person in the field is rewarded for risk mitigation and cost control. And the person in the boardroom is rewarded for hitting its ESG metric. Suddenly, you see this data pipeline being created. AI is at the core of the decision matrix. And data is central to this. And you, know, you can build multiple of these things. So it isn't just vertically and horizontal. You can see this zigzag pattern for like uh, democratizing right. and digitizing data and AI. Yeah, it's it's um, well, that was a there's a whole bunch in there that actually is really good. We um, it's funny how it seems like any of these things that we do, whether it's podcasts or lives or whatever it is, no matter what topic we tackle, we always end up talking about two things. One is you know dealing with the historical data challenges that the industry has. We always end up we always end up there, and we always end up talking about you know culture and organizational change and things like that. Um, so so I want to get into that um, a little bit more, but but just to survey the industry a bit. Um, and and Ration, you touched on a few things there where you know it can be used in various uh, various operations um, in upstream, Kevin. You mentioned before you, you started talking a little bit about a couple of places where you know we can do something with inspections or we can do something um uh you know uh in 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 various facilities um what else do you kevin where else do you see uh just very tac you know practical tangible sorts of applications of this from an operational and i'm thinking like in terms of operations and facilities and the places where you know the business is really kind of carried out so I suppose, and, and I saw a question come in from YouTube, you know, well, how does the technology help us improve business and make life easy? And if you look at oh. some of the, 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 the low hanging fruit, as I would call them. So today, you know, many folks mentioned the amount of data we're getting. We're getting a lot of stuff in terms of um, IoT and data coming from everywhere and wherever. So let's just say, take midstream pipelines. So you need to figure out if the pipeline is in good condition, right? So instead of, you know, years ago, somebody would walk up and down, and today you have drones, sensors, and whatever. Now, there's so much data. There's low Earth satellites, whatever. No one's going to be able to print all that out and look at it and try and figure it out. So people have software that helps them manage pipeline integrity. You know, we talked about ESG. Well, you need to make sure you don't have fugitive emissions, blah, blah, blah. So you need to make sure you, you get ahead of the curve and spot anything that's going to break before it breaks. So people are using software packages to take all that data from sensors, vibration, images, whatever, using their own knowledge, come up with a, an algorithm, for a better word, and figure out where they need to do some predictive maintenance and f spot things beforehand. So in, in and many of the software packages that you buy off the shelf or you have them on... Uh, NVIDIA AI platforms, whether on prem or in the cloud or whatever, they're using machine learning and all sorts of different bits of AI. You know, the, the point is AI means everything to everybody, right? But there's sure. different programming concepts and it's assisted machine learning and it's machine learning and neural networks and then then. But that's one. Yeah. A second one that I've seen quite a few companies talking about using, again, that different types of, of the technologies to help. Cybersecurity is a feature yep. of today's world. And as you increase more IoT and we do more stuff in the cloud and then the threat surface becomes bigger, right? There's more vectors. So again, you'll have multiple different security systems, be it physical security. Is that the right guy in the right place? Is he wearing a hard hat and a vest and a face mask today? 
Um, yeah. Or is there all this data coming in and is it I mean, being spoofed or is someone trying to log in at that remote something somewhere? Years ago, people had a, a, a SIM, um, a security information and event management system, trying to right. get all the data from everything to try and put it on a big dashboard to say you're good or there's a problem going on. There's something weird right. going on over here. People are now using AI algorithms, and again, depends on what, what you mean, but they're using that to try and gather all the data and and and, come, and, and tell the people, look, there's there's been 400 logins from weird places on this site for the last whatever. Do something. Yeah, um, yeah, so yeah. Th 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 that's where I'm seeing it. But it, 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 to Kayla's point, um, and, and, and you know, to Mark's point, and to, whether, it, whether it's the technology and whether it's in the cloud or it's on-prem and it's tensor cores or it's whatever, it, it's about answering a, 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 I need to figure out what's going on in, situational awareness of cybersecurity, and I need to take cost out and make sure I don't have something breaking when I didn't expect it. Yeah, yeah. That's how you add value. So what, what you're describing is um, because of the fact that we have so many things, so many more things that are connected now, um, and there's just, uh, I mean, there's so many more data points, so many more touch points, so many different things to observe and manage. Um, it makes sense that we would have like, like we just like as, as, as humans, we just can't keep our eye on all those things and gather all that data and handle it. So we're going to have to have some help doing that. And if we don't, then we've just kind of wasted money putting all you know all these new sensors and and I like what do we, like if we can't make use of it. Um, so uh, so that oh I see we're getting is that a question? I, I you know I always have to put my glasses on to read the questions. Um, okay, that that's a big question. We're gonna let's let's. Um, Let's that's a whole back. topic. That's a whole yeah, episode. Uh, whole yeah. yeah, the PhD topic. Let's see if we can't touch on some of that as we get into this. What? Um, um, there's another aspect, though, in the industry that I know is very um, important. And sometimes people don't appreciate, people outside of this industry don't really have an appreciation for you know, like how much risk and uncertainty we, we deal with. And, you know, I mean, one uh, one bad decision can be, you know, a lot. I mean, can be can be a billion dollars, or 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 it could or it could be worse. It could impact uh, people's health and safety. But there's so much risk and uncertainty that we're dealing with. And Kayla, you know, we talk about this all the time. Um, and I know, you know, from your exploration background, and Daniel, you've got you've got this in 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 your background as well. That's where some of the really the big bets are made, and um, and there's a lot of risk. So. When you think about AI and some of these different capabilities we're talking about, is there a way that we can use this to um, to kind of future proof some of those big decisions um, so that we, we pull the risk out early and we set ourselves up for more success later on without, uh, you know, so much so much risk of loss? Yeah, that, is there, I, that was just an easy question. I just thought I'd throw that out there. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, and, and I do think we have an unfair uh, street reputation um, just because, yeah, like you mentioned, we are generally risk averse as an industry. But that's also because two things, you know, there are serious implications for bad decisions, both on health, safety, environmental aspects. But also, like these are significant dollars that we're spending uh, yeah. to do these things. To and produce so, a commodity, basically, right? Yeah. 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 So, so when, you, yeah. when you think about like the necessary um, aspect of reducing uncertainty, reducing the amount of risk um, as much as possible, you know, exploration, field development, oper you know, field operations—it's all the same thing. Around, we have enough information. You know, we've got all of this democratized information at our fingertips. Uh, we have enough to formulate, you know, generic sample sets of predictability. If we do this, these three things will happen. If we do that, these other three things will happen. Right, right. And so, you know, it's kind of also that human element as well around freeing up the physical science domain expertise to focus on maybe out of sample um, type of situations and, yep, and let, yep. AI, let ML kind of uh, take the redundancy out of a lot of the mundane tasks. I mean, I see PhD engineers sitting there trying to, uh, you know, wrangle data in Excel, even to this day. Um, and so it's about, you know, freeing up the human capital to make better uh, decisions, as well as reducing, you know, the amount of risk and uncertainty that you have on, on a lot of these high capital spend projects. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's exactly, that's kind of exactly what I was thinking. In fact, I, I'm, as you're saying that, um, you know, Daniel, I'm thinking about 
um, is that when we when we when we when we think about using this as a tool for risk reduction, I mean that is that something that maybe some of the people that you work with would see that as like okay now that's something that I could embrace and I could adopt because you know that's that's saving me from being the person right that you know I can I can if if I can help do that and and I know that you're not um, and I have seen you embrace. Uh, very advanced technology before. So is that is that the sort of thing that uh, is kind of a uh, uh, attractive and would cause people to engage with those capabilities? Absolutely, Michael. That most definitely. And that, you remember the days at Headwave? Yes, where basically I do. I said, well, the system, yeah. we are very much, you know, what we do is seismic interpretation. And one of the things I said to Headwave is like, well, if you, you have to have an interpretation system in there. If you don't have an interpretation system, I don't need it. I don't even don't want to see it. The reason is that what you really need is what I call sort of computer assisted interpretation. Because even the best interpreter needs some assistance and their computer can actually help yeah. and solve some of these problems automatically. I mean, picking base salt is no fun, yeah? You don't no. want to spend weeks and weeks to pick base salt. And then yeah. you change the velocity and you start all over again. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's right, gruesome. Right. So if there a computer can assist one of my 30 year explorers to actually become better that's that's excellent yeah then that's the right. other good thing about something like this is that we we have right now we have a lot of old folks in the industry 30 plus years they're mainly all consultants right now uh, and and younger folks which also means that if you now the older folks help design such a system it then can be used by younger folks just starting in the industry and be successful much faster yeah yeah that's a good um that's great. I, I mean, yeah, we talk about this uh, 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 crew change all the time, and that yeah. is uh, that's a, that's a really good point. I mean, that's something that I, you know I hadn't really even thought about. But um, um, in fact, speaking of things that we haven't thought about, uh, Ration, I know that I, I so so I know you're always thinking about something that nobody else is thinking about, and and you always have uh, some sort of uh, like ideas that are kind of like. But, but what if we could do this? So before we kind of before we get away from some of this, what um, um, and and I also want to and Mark, maybe this is a good time for you to chime in too, because some of this stuff sounds kind of uh, like too futuristic to be true. So, um, but 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 it is. But we're doing it in a lot of cases. So so Ration from your from your AI uh, viewpoint, like. What else is out there that we could be doing uh, that would bring value to the industry and um, that maybe isn't isn't something obvious? This is this is more of a fun topic, really. Yeah. So if you look at the natural progression of um, you know most industries, they're moving towards a gig type economy for um, for their verticals. I see the same happening with energy over time. You know, once you move away, once you move towards these more connected systems and the communications increase. We should be able to see gig type economies for oil and gas, but it'll also be for utilities too, because they'll be emerging between, uh, you know, different energy sources, uh, and and it'll all be called energy at some point, and we'll be able to leverage it. And it isn't really sci-fi, right? If you look at what um, Nvidia is doing, you know, they have, uh, you know, Isaac and Metropolis, which is these smart cities that they're able to track, they're able to track, you know, transportation, people going in, people going out, they'll be able to, you know, communicate that faster. Isaac is, is all around their, uh, managing their robotics. This technology exists, right? And we'll see a lot more like um, uh, decentralization of processing. So we'll see a lot more things done on the edge, a lot of IoT uh, sensors. And as those increase over time, uh, we'll be seeing new IoT devices coming in like smart dust, for example, which are these little tiny little robots kind of float around. They'll be sitting on pipelines. They'll be, be able to track, you know, uh, variances in chemical and in temperature. Yep. Uh, and then all of that still, that's just the AI processing. That still produces, you know, petabytes of data. That data has to sit somewhere. This is where these open data ecosystems come in that can, you know, can manage real-time data, streaming and batch data, but also at the same time, you know, manage data integrity and accuracy. This is where we're seeing the lake houses are now uh, transforming these type of industries. Um, all of this can happen. And at the end result, you'll see a combination of both uh, natural language processing uh, bots managing the decision and humans interpreting and then benefiting from it and then back and forth. Right. Right. The, um, I, I mean, it's, it, it, it does sound kind of sci-fi um, and it's kind of futuristic, but as you mentioned, NVIDIA is actually producing some of these foundational technologies. Mark, is there anything else you wanted to 
chime in on that. And then I want to, there was a good question that flashed up there. So I want to come back to that as well. But uh, um, what else? <clears throat> Give us a little bit more of a, of a peek into the world of what we can do today that we, that we couldn't do before. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, we, we cover a variety of different uh, industries at NVIDIA. And what we're seeing in different industries can be applied to the oil and gas industry or the en energy industry in general. Kevin mentioned video analytics, right? And the ability to look for corrosion, to, to look for operations that are not in line, right? We're, we're seeing a lot of those things occurring today in, in predictive maintenance, but even more than the science side of it and the engineering side of it, um, I remember a conversation with the chief digital officer, one of the, the super majors, and, and, and he said, one of our number one goals is to improve the employee experience. And I said, well, what does that mean? He said, our employees are really tired of, for looking for data. They spend so much of their time looking for data that they're not doing science. They're not doing what they want right. to be doing things. And so, I, you know, it made me think about Alexa and it made me think about Siri and Facebook and Amazon. It, it, it never fails that I go to Amazon and I see something that I was looking for or talking to somebody about or, um, you know, Facebook, all of a sudden there's an advertisement for something I was looking for. And I, I think leveraging the tools that are available there today, right, not in the future, but today, companies can train these models using platforms that we offer and others offer to basically train on all their previous data and emails. So you can ask a question or at least get a recommendation as to which drill bit you might want to use to be more efficient. Or you might ask who approved this AFE and, and have somebody respond to you with an answer, not just a keyword search that you've got to go scan through 50 documents looking for an answer. We're getting to a point now where as these companies look to improve their employee experience, um, AI is going to allow them to just be that much more efficient and they're going to spend more time doing science and solving yeah. problems than looking for data, which is because data, right, right. Yeah. Wrong for people. So um, definitely an area that is not fancy in engineering, but really helps the employees do science. And yeah, so yeah. I mean, that that is. Um... Um, yeah, we've seen that so many times over the years and, um, and Kayla and, you know, we, we used to talk about, you know, very skilled geoscientists who spent, you know, most of the week just kind of taking, you know, finding all the data and putting it in the spreadsheet and moving it from that thing to the other thing. You also mentioned though, um, uh, Mark, you met, I'm glad you mentioned drill bits in there because there was a question <laughs> that, that came up about uh, drill drill bits and drilling parameters. And Kevin, I, I know you have a photographic memory. So um, did, you, <laughs> did you, did you, want, did you want to, uh, did you have any thoughts on that? Or did anybody else have any uh, thoughts on that? Um, uh, uh, on that question there? Uh, dull grading of drill bits, drilling parameters, optimization, historical data, predictive maintenance. Um, so, the, uh, sorry, I was on mute. Um, so the question came in, was there any examples of where oil and gas companies have used AI in the broad term today and what business values? And um, Omar came back with a, a bunch of them. To be quite honest, if you go to any oil and gas site or go to NVIDIA, uh, their, their energy site, you'll see case studies and whatever. And it varies. You know, that was um, mentioned earlier. That how you get value in seismic is very different to how you get value in running a pipeline, right? There's there different things. There's different mathematical models. There's different use cases and, and, and. But it, one thing I, I just throw out there, um, we talk about the skills, all the knowledge kind of going away. And, you know, in today's world, with all of the, the uh, carbon neutral and, and, and coming down the line, the industry is right. changing. And people would say, well, all that seismic knowledge and whatever, that's going to go away because we won't need it. Well, I personally believe that if we don't get carbon capture working, we're not going to hit any of the targets. And if you want to sequester carbon, it's reservoir modeling and seismic. If, if you have the European goal that we have here on a hydrogen economy, you need to pump this stuff around. That's pipelines. And if yeah. you want to float hundreds of floating wind turbines off the west coast of Ireland, that's coming from the boys that are putting rigs floating around. So it's the same technology for a whole right. different use case. But the... The knowledge, the algorithms, the way we compute that at the edge, whatever, that's that's not going anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, that that's very good. And Daniel, I 
I see you like nodding vigorously. So, um, um, so, for, so you're not at odds with the AI guy right at this moment. So let's, what else, what else, what else, what else are you thinking about uh, in that regard? I think one, one of the key points is we need to find where can we actually use AI successfully? Where is it going to impact our bottom line today? People are not looking for a solution 10 or 15 years from now. If they want it really right now. So I think that was some of the questions actually. Yeah. And I really appreciate Kevin's point because indeed carbon capture is there. Uh, we talk a lot about solar panels and wind. Geothermal is another one, yeah? I mean, for geothermal energy, you're going to need That's quite a number brilliant. of geologists and good seismic. And drilling, because now drilling, you're not going to stay in the sedimentary column. You're going to go into granite. Yeah, well, good luck with that one, yeah? So I think there is, there is, there is a future. I, I know companies tend to call themselves energy companies right now. Uh, because, well, oil and gas is kind of bad. Well, that's called rebranding. But in fact, you have to be very careful. I mean, an oil and gas company is not a utility company. That's something completely different. Right. right. But even if, for both of them, whether utility company or oil and gas company, AI is applicable in certain areas. So let's be very clear what these areas are and what it can deliver and when. Yeah. Exactly. I think that's well, what most executives really want to know, yeah. And, and I'm definitely, maybe I'll just title myself, I'll give myself the royalty title of queen of actual problems. <laughs> you know, uh, one, that, that, yes, yes. Yeah, one that I was uh, recently working on was in the instance of, of a midstream facility. So on, on average, these facilities are generating hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of profit um, on any given day, lots of physical equipment, um, I was working on a project where we build uh, digital twins of the midstream facility. So when things start to get off spec or out of range, um, we can statistically point the human who would normally be sifting through hundreds of different things that could be going wrong and, and where to troubleshoot them and what to do about it. And we can give them here are the top five within 95% um, accuracy. Those are the ones that you should focus on. And so, you know, we can go to rebalancing uh, plants within a few days versus, you know, sometimes it takes people four months to figure out what the actual issue is. And so, again, it's that like redundant task of sifting through data to find actual results. Yeah. 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 Those are all Kayla, you're so right. Actually, in the North Sea, we now have digital twins of production platforms. Very useful. Very useful. Yeah. And you actually yeah. convert old platforms. You use you don't, it's not a new platform you build. You can actually take an old platform and create a digital twin. Very useful. Absolutely. Yeah. Again, this is a niche application where you're going to immediately add value, yeah? and everybody will understand that. Uh, if so I may, just Star Wars kind of thing, yeah. Well, it, it, uh, there was a question earlier. I, I forget the name. Uh, chatting about uh, the power grids and DER and whatever. In L in Italy, they have a um, a network yeah. digital twin. A digital twin of the grid, yeah. substations, power, you name it, end to end, LIDAR, bleh, whatever. Um, so that in all parts of the world, that's where they're headed, right? So you can imagine the compute requirements behind that to keep it working, right? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, these are oh, excellent, excellent examples. I think um, uh, we could probably... I'm, I'm watching the time here, so we're getting down to kind of the last ten minutes. We could probably go on at this point with uh, with lots of good examples, which is is great. Um, what that means is that we, we're far enough down the road with some of this stuff that we've really seen how okay, it can add value here, here, and here in the business, and these are all the great things that we can do. Um, but then, of course, the question always comes up, um, and maybe we can just touch on this quickly before we uh, before we run out of time, and that is how do we? Okay, great, but how do we actually go get started with this? And somebody will always ask, and what's it going to cost? And, um, and, and Nicholas is going to ask a really robust question. So let's, let's pause on this for a second. Cause maybe his thing is more important than what I was just about to do. Um, we're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Decarbonization is not going to be just about one more solar, just about more solar panels and batteries, a solution that is not dispatchable. And synchronous is a tool. Ration, this one's got you written all over it. So I'm going <laughs> to let you finish reading. So, <laughs> it's going to take me 10 minutes to read the question. And, we will, and I think what we're going to do is maybe maybe the top, let's let's talk about this a little bit. And maybe the, the, the part about how do we get started with all this and what does it cost and what are the options? Maybe we save that for the next episode. But um, what, what do we? 
on, on this on this point here, so the whole concept, yeah, the, the whole decarbonization and net zero, um, you know, it's it's not that it's anti fossil fuel, it's anti emissions, right? So how do we reduce the emissions? And and right. my, my personal opinion is that we will probably be using oil and gas for decades, but we got to get rid of the emissions. Period. Right. That's hard to do, and it's going to take time. But anyway. Um, but like the dispatchable loads and whatever. And yes, there are challenges by putting in massive amount of solar residential the before the meter, behind the meter, blah, blah, whatever. But last year in Europe, on average, 18% of the energy came from renewable energy sources. And on some days in the UK, in Germany, in Denmark, it was 100%. Is it hard to balance the grid and keep all the frequencies going when you have all this non-dispatchable stuff? Yes, but again, they're using software packages that would make your mind melt to try and figure this out in real time, right? Because the grid is a real time, the biggest real time engine on the planet. Um, so, so yes, but if I may, adding more and more renewables to a grid doesn't break it. You need to fix, you need to deal with it, but it doesn't break it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wait, any uh, any other thoughts on that? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I want to jump in a little bit, right? You know, so I think you know what's happening is. This rebranding to calling yourself an energy company because that's what Equinor did. Uh, they used to call you know, um, yeah. that's all. became Equinor, right? So it isn't just rebranding, you know, just to you know have a PC title. I think it fundamentally depends on who your customers are, right? Like ultimately, yes, we will until we completely eliminate the need for hydrocarbons. We'll still need to power several vehicles and in planes and you know and so on. It also produces several other products that we use in you know in other industries. But it really depends on it, right? If we are seeing an uptake in electric vehicles or electric, you know, uh, other technology, we will see uh, energy companies diversify from traditional oil and gas and start doing an uptake into renewables because they ultimately want to be producing electricity and then storage of it, and then also then you know reducing the emissions that are based on it. So it it, it is actually an interesting place to be. I think energy and transition is really what they should be called themselves, but it's it's too long in title, so they just dropped off the in transition. <laughs> um, but but this is where, where we're going to be. We're going to be in this hybrid type energy for a long time, and it isn't you know one more than the other. It just depends on who the consumer is and what they demand from that company. Right, right. So, I think I think that's a really good point, and you know we are seeing such an emergence of startups in this area, right? So there there's big companies, right? And I spent some time with. Uh, um, Vinod Phillips, who's the CTO of Siemens Energy this morning, and he's talking about exactly those things, right? He's talking about how do we balance the grid moving forward, right? Going from 8,000 power generation areas to over a million when you include all the solar and it's bi-directional. And how do you do that? Because if you waste electricity, you're basically creating emissions for no good reason, right? Because you're you're building them, producing energy, and then you're getting it created locally with solar or other things. So you're wasting but there are so many startups in the industry right now that are trying to solve these problems as well. And we're seeing a lot of the oil companies, venture arms, investing in these small right. startups as well, because they recognize that these folks are either going to solve the problem and get bought by somebody bigger, or that they're going to help them to solve the problem. And, and these young creative people that are doing these things are amazing. We started working with this, this company called Caruso Energy that are actually putting containers at well sites and they're running data centers off of flare gas. Flare gas. And yep. they're reducing emissions by 40%. And they're powering a one megawatt data center. And it's a lot easier to run a network cable than it is a pipeline. So, you know, as opposed to running the gas to a data center, they're bringing the data center there. So things like this, um, you know, to Nicholas's point, this is how um, we're gonna transition and remove emissions but still leverage oil and gas that's going to be around for our lifetimes. Yeah. It's funny. Um, there's this thing that I like to say sometimes uh, on some of the podcasts, which is if, if you're trying to solve the problem of how to, you know, provide power for the whole world um, in some new way, then maybe the best people to ask are the people who figured out how to do it the first time. Right. And especially when it comes to the scaling and the operations and the things like that. Um, so, so, so we don't discount the fact that some of the, some of these, uh, traditional oil and gas companies like you're talking about have, have great ways of solving these problems, but together with, um, with the new innovators 
who have the the speed and the agility to uh, to to focus in on uh, the, the the spots where something new really needs to be created, and then you put that together with an industry that understands science and engineering and knows how to how to how to deploy and scale and operate that stuff at scale across the world. That um, you know that doesn't sound like uh, a recipe for failure. That sounds like uh, like we could be very successful. I know I see heads nodding, so we got a couple of minutes. Anybody else uh, want to chime in on that? You, you know, I, I suppose. Okay, I, I'm in Europe, so I see a lot of the the shell and the BP. BP spent 900 million pounds for the rights for a wind farm site in the Irish Sea, right? Um, look at what Shell New Energy Ventures are in getting invested in, to, to Mark's right. point. Um, what I know Vinod and, and Siemens Energy and some of the stuff they're doing with electrolyzers and partners and ecosystems and, 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 creating a whole hydrogen economy. Um, they're all commercial companies, yeah. right? They, right? They have shareholders. And the trick is, how do you keep the lights on today and, and get to where we need to get to over the next 10, 20 years, right? It's an energy transition. Um right. And and I think you know technology will help us. It's not the answer. And you know I've been in my previous world. I was one of the people going around going, "Oh, look at this new kind shiny chip and blah blah blah." And it's like, what problem does it solve? I don't know, but buy one. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we we got to get a better balance. But we do need to push the boundaries because the, the technology will help us. It won't fix everything, but it will help yeah. us. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, there we go. Russ has just uh, has just uh, given us the queen of actual problems on the on the screen. Is that is that from your Facebook, Kayla? Is that your? Is that your I'm Facebook? gonna I'm gonna update my LinkedIn and resume immediately. And there, right. okay, queen, excellent. Queen, queen so, of actual, queen of problem queen solving, of, no? Queen yeah. of actual actual yeah. problems. Um, well, and I mean, I I would add to uh, the discussion around. It's really fascinating to see people bringing the best of everything that we have to mm -hmm. offer, technology, physical science, appreciation, to really solve these problems. Because at the end of the day, we are passionate about finding resolutions to a lot of these problems. But I think it's the you know, natural pairing that we find ourselves in with a, a physical science and a data science brain you know, matched up to where we can uh, be curious enough about the process along the way to have an appreciation for the magnitude of, of the results that we're talking about. Right, right. And by the way, there's uh, somebody from Kayla's fan club is just has just chimed in there on the bottom on the bottom of the screen. Um, yeah, no, this is all this is all really good stuff. I think maybe we we got into um, you know we started off talking about AI and um, and and which naturally just kind of leads us into these broader discussions about the industry and transition and how are we using it in all these different ways and and so I think um, uh, so I think we have some good things to maybe kind of uh, flesh out in the uh, subsequent episodes of this series and we can maybe dive into some of those a little bit deeper that we didn't get into today. We got about two minutes left, so I'm going to have to uh, wrap up. And I want to first say thank you to all the panelists. And uh, I think we managed uh, to have a, uh, a civil time in spite of the fact that there are six of us um, on the screen. It was really good. I really appreciate all of you. I know you're all very busy and you all have important things to do. So it's great that you're able to, to chime in. Also, thanks again to our sponsor, NVIDIA. And, um, you know, I, it's great to have... Uh, to have partners like this that are willing to come in and provide, speaking of keeping the lights on, keep the lights on for programs like this, because, because really and truly uh, without the sponsors, we're not doing this. This all goes away. So it's, it's, so thank you to them uh, for that support. And also let's not forget, thanks to uh, Mr. Russ, Johns and, the, and his crew at Pirate Syndicate who are behind the scenes here making all this happen and 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 working the controls they they do it for all the OGDN live streams they do a fantastic job um speaking of OGDN live streams uh there are more of them that you can check out uh they're coming out monthly we've got all our podcasts that uh naturally everybody loves and so you can go to OGGN.com to find out about all of that you can look at our, at our LinkedIn profile and see the events that are coming and all the groups that we have. We've got the street team. We've got other things happening. So be sure and check all that out. And, and most importantly, found this particular 
episode to be interesting, then look for the next one, which should be coming up shortly. And we will see you next time.